Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. I celebrated my pastor and his wife getting a little opportunity to take a break for a week. And so what did they do? They went to Tuscumbia, Alabama, where I'm from. And they rode around and went to Helen Keller, uh, place there where she was born if you don't know about Helen Keller she was deaf she was blind and she was unable to speak and then uh, later she learned how to speak because she'd never heard words she didn't know how to say words and to make amazing story of Helen Keller amen so that was where I was born and I know HD was crossing Florence when I met him uh, I met him years ago but we're from the same area well Pastor Mike goes by my home my house takes a picture of it and sends it to me Amen. So he, he went up on Wheeler Mountain to see where his uh, young spiritual son was born and raised. Amen. So that, that was a cool thing. I'll go back to that little town of Tuscumbia. I can tell you when it was. It was April 1980. I was 19 years old. I had such a hunger for God. And uh, a man came through on a Sunday morning and preached from the college that I later ended up getting a bachelor's degree from in San Antonio. But at that time, I was just a young, hungry Joseph, just wanted to hear from God. And, and uh, he started preaching, and he said, I'm going to preach the next seven nights. Now, this is unheard of today. People don't go to church for seven nights. It's hard to get here on Sunday. But uh, even in this area, the traffic's gotten so bad. But this little, little country church in Tuscumbia, Alabama, off North Hook Street, he started preaching on the seven sayings from the cross. And I had no idea at the time that Jesus even said seven things while he was on the cross. And each night he took one. And it's been the, um, the blessing of my life to have taken each one of those statements and preaching a whole message on. I won't do that now. I'll concise it and, and, and uh, make it a little more concentrated for you. But as I heard each one, and I remember I made every one of those meetings. I was a burger flipper for the Sonic restaurant. Amen. And I made sure as a young man that, uh, no, as a matter of fact, at 19, I was working for RC Cola. So I was getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning, but I didn't care. I, I was at church every night to listen to the gospel. And, and even if there was just a, a handful of people there on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night, I had to hear about those seven sayings. Amen. And I found out that each one, it's the last things you say on this earth that will probably mean the most to those loved ones around you. It's words you want to hear. As a matter of fact, your last statements on the earth uh, become a testament to you. They, they they're actually become law. If you were to go down and say that somebody had hurt you and you say their name, that's probably going to go to court because that was your last statement on this earth. Amen. I want my last statements. Well, wouldn't it be nice to say thank you, Jesus? I love you, Lord. Amen. To speak to others. Hallelujah. I, that's the way I'd like to go. I don't want to go like the other people in the car wreck who were screaming uh, while Grandpa was sleeping. You'll get that in a minute. Grandpa was driving. Are you comfortable? Luke chapter 23. Oh, to get used to wearing glasses. I walk out of the house without them, get in the car, have to go back and get them so I can see the signs down the road. I can read, okay, can't, I couldn't see y'all in the back. Amen. It's this right here. I couldn't tell who most of you are like that. So I'm trying to learn to keep them on. Amen. Pray for me. Hallelujah. Amen. I would love to just get healed so I ain't got to wear them no more. That'd be the best thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, through those seven meetings, my mind was made up that everything had changed. My gate was set. You know, as a young boy, I, I, yeah, I'm 19, I'm a young man, but I'd made up my mind at that time. I'm not going back to the alcohol in which I came from. I'm not going to go back to the life that I once led. I actually moved out of the house with my parents and moved in to an apartment on you know, North Hook Street, in uh, North High Street in Tuscumbia, Alabama, with a friend of mine, a man, and we both worked shift work, and I just, everything changed. Amen. I, my, my prayer life changed, everything from listening to the gospel. So I pray the gospel has that effect on you in this house. You know, if it didn't, then I would feel like, well, I just need to get on out of the way. Amen. Let God do whatever he wants to do with other people. But I believe the gospel has a power to change us. Amen. 
So as we're reading through Luke chapter 23, and let me just preface this to you to get to where we're at today because we're going right near the crucifixion. We're going to move past the Passover meal where 12 men laid in, in circles in, in the, the wine and the bread. The traitor was designated. Judas Iscariot went out into the night, and it was no longer a day for him. We're going to realize and skip over right now the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus went and prayed. And he prayed how many times? Three times. Not my will, but thine be done. Amen. When he fought over the cup, he said, let this cup pass from me, the cup of suffering, of pain. Nobody here likes to be beat. Nobody here likes to be accused. Nobody likes to, be, uh, to have your beard plucked, amen, or to be spit upon. Nobody likes that. And that's what Jesus was going through into the night. There was a trial. The 600 men come up to the side. They took Jesus in. Judas kissed him, betrayed him. And now we find that the crucifixion is fixing to take place. And we read, amen, out of the Scripture, uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 26. As they led him away, speaking of Jesus, they see Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Oh, what a memorial to be the man that got to carry the cross for Jesus. Amen. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Anoint my lips to share our hearts to receive it. God, open our hearts to get hold of this through this season. Lord, let us never be the same again in Jesus' name. And everyone shout. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I woke up fatigued this morning, was telling the guys in the back and, and uh, Cindy, that one of the things that I've often taught on is what I call circular consistency, that life is not linear as if it is more circular. And oftentimes we're at the top of our circle, and we're feeling good, and other people are at the bottom. Amen. That's called depression down here. It happens to everybody. You're not exempt because you're the only one that gets depressed. You're not exempt because you're the only one that's excited about life. Amen. We all get there at times. Sometimes it takes a vacation, a, a few days, a few hours, maybe some time in prayer. But in my life, I found that Elijah was on top when he took out the, uh, the 400 prophets of Baal. And then, then Rahab said to him, I'm going to kill you. And he takes off running, goes, get to the cave. Amen. He's at the bottom of his circle. And it took God to talk to him in a still small voice to get him back to the top. David was the man that took out Goliath. Then the next thing we know, Saul's trying to kill him. He was at the top of his circle. I know mean, when you take out a Goliath, you're at the top. Amen. And the Bible says some people scream, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, David is ten thousand. You sing a song about me? I'm at the top of my circle, baby. Amen. But then all of a sudden, Saul goes after him to kill him. And he runs to the caves, and he hangs out in the caves. We find David in caves, I think, three times in the Bible. Each time he's depressed, he's at the bottom. But friends find him, family find him, and he's back at the top. I want to tell you something about life. Life is not always this way. It's not always a line that runs through. You're not always level. There are times you're at the top, and there are times you're at the bottom. My prayer is that when you come into this church, if you're at the bottom, we're able to pull you to the top when you walk out, you're smiling. Hey, Amen. I can tell you this much. During that funeral yesterday, I saw a lot of folk at the bottom. But when I stood in the back, they were all at the top on their way out. They were smiling and grinning. They thought, I, one, I had several ministers, if you would, that were here that walked by me and said, I've never heard anything like that in my life. And I thought, you hear hundreds of funerals. But no, I've never heard anything like that. And that blesses me, amen. You know what that did to me? Shoved me all the way up top of my circle. I guess that's why the, this morning when I got up, I thought, come on, Lord, help me. Help me shake this thing, because here's what happened with Jesus. He'd been at the top of his circle. He'd been healing. He'd been blessing. Amen. He'd seen the dead raised, the leper healed. And now, in the garden, he gave up his rights when he said, not my will but thine be done. He's been tried. Uh, there are times he held his peace. Sometimes don't talk to cynical people to, or toxic people. Just hold your peace around them. He didn't even talk to them. He just held his peace. And then next thing we know, he's being carried out. We know that his body has been beaten. We know that he shredded honestly from what I understand by the, the, the scourging that he took on his back. Amen. He's beaten for his belief that he is the Son of God. Amen. So two things happened on his way to Calvary. First, a man was there to carry his cross. It had been a long night, lack of sleep. The trials literally were mockeries. Loss of blood in the garden, scourging, beat, his beard plucked. Simon the Cyrene is now carrying his cross. Amen. And as they're moving through, verse 27 says, A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed. Jesus turned and said to the women, now listen to me, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, 
For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? When he speaks of green, he's talking about fruitful. The land is fruitful. Boy, what's going to happen when they seize the land and it becomes dry? When Jesus spoke these words, and I, I pondered this yesterday and again early this morning as I reread it, Lord, you didn't tell them that you were going to deliver them. You told them, you gave them a prophetic word that something bad has come. Don't wail for me. Don't cry about me. Amen. Cry for yourself. And when I look at history and I go back, I realize that the history teaches us the Jews became more and more rebellious. They revolted against Caesar and the Roman authority in 67 AD. Nero appointed Vespasian in charge of Judea, who brings several legions and begins a slow, methodical campaign of destruction to the Jews from city to city that lasted for two years. By 70 AD, believers in the city and the country, knowing the warnings and having witnessed, amen, the surrounding of Jerusalem, amen, they left for the mountains before Titus set for siege. Now, this is important. Rome under Titus for four years, they locked down Jerusalem. The atrocities were so great that mothers were turning to eat their children. So when Jesus was walking through, he didn't pronounce a curse on them. He told them prophetically, this is what's going to happen. You're going to ask for the mountains to run over you, the hills to cover you. You're going to want to run away from this. Because I'm telling you, there is a desolation coming. There's wickedness coming. Then when you read into verse 20, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee. He's telling them this on the way to his death. Amen. Judea, flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out. Let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be a great distress in the land and wrath against this people. 70 A.D., the total number of dead among the Jews were 1.1 million people. Titus besieged the city at Passover when it was filled with visitors. He waited till everybody came into worship. Then he shut the city down. There was 97,000 captives taken for slaves. No individual city had ever endured such pain. World War II was modest in comparison. For example, Hiroshima lost around 100,000. Most of them died instantly and painlessly. 1.1 million starved to death. It's amazing when I look back on history and I ask myself, God, couldn't you have stopped that? Absolutely. He could stop any war he wanted to. Sometimes he did stop war. But most of the time, he let us decide how we're going to live on this planet, who we're going to vote in, how we're going to handle life, how we'll protect ourselves. Can I get an amen? Amen. I see that all through Scripture. But now, I mean, he could have stopped his own death. The Scripture says he could have called down 10,000 angels. Shut this thing down, man. But he didn't. It's killing time. They begin to take him. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. Outside the Damascus Gate is a road, and the other side of the road is a flat area near the spot where the prophet Jeremiah is buried. Up above is a rocky outcropping. If you study it and look at it just right, it looks like the skull. As a matter of fact, that's what Golgotha meant, the skull. It looked like the eye socket. You can see eroded there, Golgotha. It was a place where the Romans did their killing. It was Friday. It was the day around 9 o'clock in the morning. The soldiers were ready to do their dirty work, Roman soldiers. They were from another part of the world. They weren't from Palestine. They weren't from Israel. They weren't followers of the law. They were simply soldiers who had to do a job. And it happened to be that they were on the death squad. They were in charge of crucifixions. On this particular Friday morning, it was a light load, only three this week. They didn't know the names. They never did. It didn't matter. They were just the executioner. From the point of view, it didn't pay to stop and think about what they did. That was for someone up the ladder. Guilt, innocence. Was it their business? They'd go crazy if they started worrying about those things. They just had a job to do. And to do their job, they needed two things, toughness and good technique. If they did a sloppy job, they were certain to hear about it. The psychology of that mob, they began to yell, crucify him. Amen. As they yelled at the time of releasing Barabbas, the criminals, ordinary guys, kind of low-life scum that fills any big city anywhere in the world, no big deal. But the third man. He was different. He had a crowd following him. Amen. Moving up the hill. Women weeping. They know it's important because they could sense the buzz. More people than usual. 
By the way, that was one of the fringe benefits, if you want to call it that, for morbidly, for being on the crucifixion squad, you never worked alone. There's something fascinating about watching someone else die. People look it up on social media. They like to watch it on their TVs. It's just something about, and we know these ain't real people dying. It's just actors. But when it is someone real, it somehow fascinates people and draws them in. Can I be very honest with you? I've never watched a race car race just for the fun of it. I got to see somebody wrecked. Come on, give me an amen. Don't tell me you don't. I went, I went to watch Richard Petty go down in Talladega. Okay, get back over here. Maybe they didn't love it. They couldn't stay away. Some strange magnetic force drew them back to Skull Hill again and again. But this day, there were more people than usual. This big crowd, noisy, rowdier, milling to and fro, waiting for the action to begin. Up the road comes a parade of people led by a brawny foreigner carrying a cross. That couldn't be the one they were going to crucify. It turns out he was a man by the name of Simon. The crowd swirls around and behind him, a stooped figure, a man not quite six feet tall, now walking each step an agony to behold half a man, half a creature from the worst nightmare you've ever seen. He'd been beaten with an inch of his body. His back was in shreds. His front was covered with the markings of the whip. His face was disfigured and swollen where they had ripped out the beard by the roots. And on his head, a crown of thorns, six inches, stuck long into the skin, the shell of a man. A man already seemingly more dead than alive. Then the fellows on the crucifixion detail saw that. They weren't unhappy because sometimes people got a little feisty when you tried to nail them to the cross. No, they, they didn't mind getting a person who was almost dead because it meant their work would be easy. They laid the cross on the ground. They laid the body of Jesus on the cross. He moved. He moaned. He didn't do much. One hand over here, one hand over there. Wrapping rope around his arm and around the other arm, around his legs, probably bent and partially rested on a small platform, they drove the spike into the forearm, side of the wrist, so that when the weight of the cross fell, the spike wouldn't rip through the hand. A spike in both wrists and then a spike through the legs. With the ropes in place, they began to pull the cross up. Jesus now spurts blood from the raw wounds steadily now. Boy, steady. Don't drop it. It was a terrible thing to drop a cross before they got it in the hole. They dropped it. It fell in with a thud. There was Jesus, naked and exposed before the world, beaten, bruised, bloody. The soldier stood back, satisfied, a job well done. Then someone yelled, get the dice, roll it for his clothes. Verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be crucified. When they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left, the crucifixion, those hands, those hands that were used to heal, those hands that broke the bread, those hands that reached out to the hurting, they drove spikes in. The feet that carried the good news, amen, that walked upon the water, that walked into the mountains to pray, those feet nailed to the piece of wood. There's no Novocaine, his back, his stomach, his face torn, thorns piercing, amen, hands and feet pinned, uh, dehydration setting in, the sweating from the body, the cramps without any relief to not be able to, to stretch or to push or to pull away the cramps, the cramps on the ground. John 19:19 19, 19 says that the chief priest requested the words to be changed. Pilate had noticed and prepared fastened to the cross, he read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews, they protested to Pilate. Hey, you can't write that. That's the whole reason that we're having him crucified. He's not the king. He's not the son of God. And what did Pilate say? I wrote what I wrote. He's the king of the Jews. But that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. He is the king of the Jews. Amen. That's who he is. And then his last word, 9 a.m., the crucifixion. Six hours later, they're going to take him down. Within that span of time, those parentheses of life, so many things were set in place. He had some words he needed to say. His first one dealt with reconciliation. When he looked down upon the thieves, excuse me, the, 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 uh, the, those that beat him, those that tried him, those that 
lied about him, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, the chosen one, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. You tell me, isn't it enough humiliation to just be crucified? Or how about just remove my clothes from me? Not like the other two criminals, but now I sit naked on the cross, and you're going to begin to jeer me and laugh at me and mock me. They did that. As they drove the spike sitting to the ground, he said, Father. As they dropped it into the hole, Father. As they uncovered him, Father. As they sneered and mocked him, Father. Father, forgive them. But they don't know what they're doing. I will tell you, from the beginning of time, God had already planned all this out. That's why the son fought so hard when he said, not my will, but thine be done. But here at this moment, he's saying it over and over again. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When I read this, it hit me. How many times have we done something stupid? And we wanted to say, Father, forgive me, but I didn't know what I was doing. Amen. Forgive me for being stupid. Amen. When I read what Jesus did, and this is the blessing. You want to hear the blessing? I'm going to read you the blessing. Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will give him a portion. Uh, read it out of the message, Pastor. Okay, I will. Well, watch what it says here. Uh, because he embraced the... Con Go back up one. I think we're ahead. Are we ahead? That is. Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly. Isaiah, this was written uh, about 1,500, 2,000 years before Jesus died on the cross. And this is what the Father said. Hey, I'm going to reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen. Look death in the face, didn't flinch. Amen. They drive in the nails, didn't flinch. Dropped him in the hole, didn't flinch. Amen. He looked at them, hallelujah, because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of all the black sheep. Any black sheep in the church? I said any black sheep in the church? Amen. I've always felt like a black sheep, out, you know, just out of, uh, out of sort, uh, different than the rest. When you get born again, oftentimes you, sleep, you think, well, what? You become a black sheep? Amen. They don't understand you. They don't understand why you ain't doing what you used to, why you act, ain't acting, why well, you ain't talking like you used to talk. Amen. They're black sheep. He took up the cause for all us black sheep. But when I read this part right here, the company of the lowest. Many times we want to be among the, um, I got to take these off. We want to be among the elite. We want to be seen known. We want our face and name on a poster. We want everybody to know who we are. Nobody knew who criminal on the right was. Nobody knew who criminal on the left was. Amen. All we understand is they were probably Barabbas' buddies, amen, involved in the insurrection. And yet, here's Jesus, keeping company with the lowest. Let me say to you, you have, may have felt like the lowest, the most beat down, the worst of the bunch. Nobody cared about you. They didn't know your name. They don't shake your hand. They don't have no appreciation for you. Welcome to the company of Jesus. Amen. Because he sat with the company. of, the, And that's why God said, I will reward him extravagantly. I, can you imagine? Can you imagine how heaven must have opened up when Jesus resurrected? In your mind, all you see is underdog or Superman or, or something like that flying through there. Jesus, when he resurrected, carried the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Amen. This, it, literally ascending from the bowels of the earth, from hell itself, coming back through earth. Amen. Taking a little visit in Jerusalem, then heading back into the heavens. When he got there, God said, I've, I'm going to reward you extravagantly. Can you imagine what a party heaven must have had when Jesus showed back up? Amen. And the only scars in heaven amen, are still upon his wrist and on his side and on his feet. And yet he, extra God said, that's how much I love my boy. Listen, parent, you're that way. Your kid does something good, you know as I do. You will you've already rewarded them for being not heads. Imagine if they were anything like Jesus. 
Hallelujah. When he came back up, each utterance spoken with the utmost difficulty. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The second was out of conversion. Because he embraced the company of the lowest, he listened to them. These two men who were crucified on the outer crosses, they differed on one main point, how they viewed the man in the middle. How do you see the man in the middle? They saw him differently and therefore asked him different things. One man wanted escape, not forgiveness. The other man wanted forgiveness. He didn't care about escape. Verse 39 says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Aren't you the anointed one? Save yourself and us. Selfish. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. He understood justice. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Ooh. And Jesus answered him. And I'll start closing with this. I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I am a thankful man that this passage, and you should be too, is in your Bible. Because if it wasn't in your Bible, things would be a whole lot different in your theology. But when I led my grandmother to Jesus, when she looked at me and said, Jerry, like, listen, my grandma was a bootlegger. My grandma was a wild child. I named after my grandma. Her name Jewel Dean. My name Jerry Dean. I carry it with honor. And when I went in to that home and I saw her laying there dying of cancer, I said, Grandma, I got to pray for you. I got to know I'm going to see you again. And she looks at me. She says, Jerry, God don't hear sinners. This was her theology. This is how she thought. God don't hear sinners. He don't hear people that's led a bad life. And I looked at her. I said, Grandma, if God don't hear sinners, none of us have a hope. None of us have a prayer. If God don't hear us, we're in trouble. And then I remember this story of a man who had led a sinful life had been wicked, knew that he deserved death, looked over at Jesus, and just simply said, remember me. You know, no, my mama's not here to cross. My daddy ain't here to cross. None of my friends are here to cross. The only other not here that I know is hanging on the other side, and I don't like him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Over his head was written, I shoot up. Jehovah, Jesus, King of the Jews, remember me when you get in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you, truth. When Jesus spoke, he's what? Truth. He's the way, the truth, the life. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. What makes this story to me so amazing when you consider that this man had none of the advantages the other disciples did? He had not been on a boat with Jesus that pulled 156 fish out of the, in one net. He had not walked on water like Peter had. He had not seen the healing like James and John had. He was simply a man on the cross next to Jesus. Many of us, we look down on people who have a, an end of life salvation. I wouldn't wait to the end of my life. I'd do it now. But I don't look down on people that finally get in. Yesterday when I did that funeral, and James works, actually had worked with this man at the same place, the wife said to me, Pastor, right before he died, I made sure he knew Jesus. And we prayed together and asked God to receive him. Now, this is a, it's a hard thing for a wife to lead a husband to the Lord. They know everything about each other. But she said, I had to do it. I did the same for my dad. Make sure that my dad, my dad didn't get a chance to come to church. The only church my dad liked was the little country church because he loved the preacher. Come on now. Amen. But I made sure my dad was ready before because I want to see him again. We'll see my sister again. So I want to tell you some things here. A promise here with three parts. 
I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in prayer. It's immediate salvation. It's personal salvation. Right now. You ain't got to do it. You ain't got to. And, and I don't mean this bad at all, but you ain't got to go 12 steps to be saved. You ain't got to do three steps to be saved. You got to call on the name of Jesus to be saved. So he called on him at that moment. And the Greek word today is the first word in the phrase. So it literally would read this way. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Meaning this very day you'll be with me. Amen. The day of your crucifixion you'll be with me. Whatever or wherever paradise is, Jesus told the thief he's going to be there. Second, personal salvation. It, the Greek word here is very important. Amen. It means with me in a very personal way. You, you know, many times, and I don't know how. I don't know how this will happen, but it's personal that we get to be with him. What he's saying to the thief is, you're going to walk with me today in paradise. Me and you are going to be together. God, I don't know how you're going to do what you're going to do. It ain't up to me to figure it out, but you're going to do it. Amen? Amen. When a king together to walk in the presence, and then next is in paradise. Now, some people get this mixed up. They think that somehow there's a holding place. The kingdom, heaven, paradise, they're synonymous. They're where Jesus is. Amen? They're synonymous. They're not, they're not a separate place for you to go hang out. Uh, somebody told me a while back they went to a funeral, and in the funeral they were trying to pray a guy out of paradise to get him into heaven. Well, look, if you die in your sins, they're not praying you out of paradise. Amen, because you won't be in paradise if you die in your sins. It's not a holding place for you. Amen, the Scripture don't teach that. When a king wanted to honor his subjects, his servants, he would invite them to walk with him in his garden in the cool of the day. It's a place of beauty, openness, and inexpressible blessedness. When God walked with Adam and Eve, paradise, paradise. I'll never forget years ago, I was invited to preach a youth camp in Paradise, California. I couldn't wait to go to Paradise, California. Oh, I've been to San Diego. I know it's beautiful. I've been to Monterey Bay. I can't wait to go to a place called Paradise, California and preach a camp. When I got there, it was dry. It was dusty. It was ugly. And the name of the camp was Pair of Dice. It was an old gambling camp. <laughs> Missed that one by that much. <laughs> Amen. But wherever Jesus is, it's paradise. Amen. If you take these promises together, you see what a remarkable thing Jesus is saying. He promised to the thief who has lived his entire life in crime, upon his death, a transference to heaven where he will be in the personal presence of Jesus. This thief received much more than he asked for. The other thief, he got what he asked for also. So in this, let me just say this to you very quickly in closing. I get these questions quite a bit. Pastor, what about baptismal regeneration? I believe when you get born again, you're saved. I don't believe the water can save you. I believe in baptism. Amen. I believe it's an outer expression of an inward love. I believe it lets the whole world know. But I do not believe you've got to be. The thief didn't get to get off the cross to go get baptized. Amen. He just believed. Hallelujah. You say, well, that was just an exception. Well, good. I'll take all the exceptions that God wants to give. Amen. I'm always looking for those exceptions. Second thing, soul sleep. Some people think when you die, and somebody sent me this message, and I didn't know exactly how to explain it to them. But some people think when you die, you stay in your body. Do you know most funerals I do today are cremations? They're memorials. Because people have realized that we came from dust, we're going back to dust. Amen. And even if the body stays in the coffin, it decays. There's nothing there. That we leave this earth suit and we go to be with Jesus and he gives us a new body. Amen. So that, that, uh, that to me is already... It's, but this soul sleep says that I sleep, I sleep till he comes again. I don't believe that. I believe to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
Amen. So I don't believe that we sleep in our body. Well, Pastor, what happens? The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, this is another one of the mysteries. I believe when the trumpet call goes off, amen, those that are with him will come back and take their bodies and go up. They will come back and get our body, our, let me just say, our appearance, what we look like. Not, not, not this beat down, wore out body. Can I get an Amen. But that appearance of us, what we look like, because the Bible says we'll be known as we're known when we get to heaven. So somehow we come back, and, and then the Bible says the dead, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we'll meet him together. In other words, those that have gone before will come back and get their bodies, and then we that are here are going to get raptured together. Amen. If we still remain on the earth, in other words, we haven't died. That's going to be an amazing thing, isn't it? Somebody said, why the dead Christ rise first? Because that's the Baptist. That way we can all meet together. That's just a little religious joke. Don't pay no attention to it. And then purgatory. Purgatory is supposed to be a place you, it's that holding place that we pray you out of and get you into heaven. There's no such thing as purgatory. Amen. To be absent from this body is to be with him. So this, this tells me that over and over. A redeemer. He died for our sins. Mm. A receiver died to sin. That's triumph. A rejecter died in sin. What a tragedy. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You are not, you are not, you are not to come to this church and die in your sin. You're not to hear the gospel preached from this pulpit and die in your sin. Amen. You're to die to sin, not in sin. You say, Pastor... If, let me ask you, if this was your last day, what would be your last words? What would you say? Amen. And how would you say it? I don't want you to die in your sin. I want to stand confidently over your coffin or your remains and proclaim that my friend, my brother, my sister has made heaven. Amen. If you've been away from God, put your hand up now and then back down again. That's two, three, four, five, six hands up. Hold those hands up. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, I refuse to die in sin. Forgive me of my sins, my shortcomings, my failures. I receive your forgiveness today. I thank you that heaven it will be my home. New body, new friends, new way of living. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. We will continue over the next uh, few weeks about his last words. And, but invite somebody next week to Easter. Now, if you hear me on social media say, uh, don't come Easter, come next week, you might hear me say that. Because I believe in my heart Easter will take care of itself. It's going to fill up in this house and out in New Caney. It's after Easter I'm always concerned about. Amen. It's the rest of the year. Hallelujah. We're, we're still open between Easter and Christmas. Amen. So we want folks to come. But I'd love to have as many folks as we can get in here packed in here next week. I didn't talk with Sister Sheila. She said, if we're too full in here, we'll release the kids early. Amen. So to keep that in mind. In front of you is a tithing offering envelope. Amen. Your giving is a, a way of showing how much you honor God and amen and how much that he has blessed you. Amen. So please, if uh, if you're a member of this church, make sure that you are a tither and a giver. I thank you for your faithfulness, particularly those online right now. We're starting to see more and more online giving. So if you give online, please just hold up your phone as the servant leaders make their way. If you have not received one of these little booklets yet, please pick up one. Amen. It's a little journal for you to use. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money. Bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. Swap will be having their meeting today. Amen. So gather with the riches right after church. That'll be a good thing. Also know that uh, two or more prayer will be taking place Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. If you need prayer, please sign up in the back at that little box uh, by the sound booth. And uh, if you're online, just make sure you send it to our app. Uh, there's, there's cards there too also they can fill out for prayer requests amen so each Tuesday night that we'll be praying 
Hallelujah. And uh, May 29th, we're going to have a Biker Sunday again out at the North Camp. Amen. So we will have Memorial Day service here. Amen. And then that's Memorial Day weekend. And then we want to, uh, I just remember last year, they just kind of shut everything down again. So we want to honor those that have been in, a, in the military, those who have passed from the military. Amen. A strong military is one reason why nobody wants to invade this country. Second reason they don't want to invade this country is all of y'all carry more guns than anybody should be allowed. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, Joseph, Pastor Joseph, you come and pray and close in here. Amen. Love you, church. Hallelujah. Joseph looking good, isn't he? Come on. <laughs>